The following audio is from Shiloh Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. More information about Shiloh Presbyterian Church is available at shilohopc.org. As you turn in your Bibles to Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, we will be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I would remind you that our catechism teaches us that the word of God becomes effectual to us unto salvation because the spirit of God makes the reading of the word, but especially the preaching of the word an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners and of building us up in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. As we listen to this word, we're listening to the very word of God If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall fully know, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his most holy word. Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you for every opportunity to gather in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Trusting and believing, O Lord, that where two or three are gathered, that there you are in the midst. So, Father, we have come and we beseech you that you would be pleased to speak to us this morning. By your Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us into your truth. Father, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in thy sight. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Well, it's a pleasure to be with you here this morning. It has been some time since the last time I had the opportunity to bring the word to the congregation here at Shiloh. In fact, this is probably the first time I've preached in this particular building, though I've attended here uh, presbytery meetings. And so it was a real joy to be able to come up and see how the Lord has provided for the congregation through the years and also to see how as we have sang that song through the years, how we long to see thy churches full, O Lord, and God adding his increase to this congregation and being able to witness a uh, public profession of faith and membership and, and the people of God coming together, it is a real joy. But it's also a joy for me always to be among you, brethren, because of the support that you give to worldwide outreach of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church that allows me the opportunity in serving our denomination to take the name of Christ to the four corners of the earth. And God has certainly been faithful to uh, the ministry of the word as it has gone forth. Churches are growing. I bring you greetings from the Evangelical Church Westminster Confession of Austria and Switzerland. The Ethiopian Reformed Presbyterian Church brings you their greetings. And 
ask me always to assure the congregations in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church that they too are praying for you as they know that you are praying for them. And so receive their greetings and continue to pray that the Lord would prosper his name in their midst. This morning we're going to turn our attention to a portion of God's word in Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, this passage is a familiar passage to you, not only because as you read through this epistle, you come to this chapter, but because it's one of those places that are quoted of the Bible in Hallmark cards, we hear it in funerals, we see it at weddings, we notice it on billboards. This is one of those portions of scripture that is as familiar to us as Psalm 23 or John 3.16. After all, who hasn't heard those words? Love never ends. But it is also an important place in Scripture because of the truth that it teaches. Spurgeon, when he was getting ready to open up this particular portion of God's Word in a series of sermons, basically looked and said, there probably won't be much in these sermons themselves, but the text is a feast in itself. Paul exhorted Timothy to give himself to the public reading of Scripture. And this is one of those places where you could do what Jesus did in Luke 4 when he read out of Isaiah, simply read the passage, sit down and say, today the word of God has been spoken in your hearing. And leave it at that. It really is a text that preaches itself. It opens up its own truth. And often when we seek to preach on it, we only get in the way of it. This also was the text that Jonathan Edwards used and preached between 1735 and 1740 during a period of revivals that came to be known as the Great Awakening. They have been preserved for us in a book called Charity and Its Fruits. God powerfully used this particular message. It is an important chapter because it teaches us an important truth that we in the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ do well to take heed to and pay attention to. To understand this text, let's put it in its context a little bit. The Apostle Paul is writing his epistle, this first epistle, to the church at Corinth. And we learn about the church at Corinth in the book of Acts, chapter 18. Remember, Paul has just finished his preaching ministry in Athens. He's left Athens. He's gone to the city of Corinth. He's begun to preach the gospel there. He's getting ready to leave, and the Lord tells him to stay. Paul ends up staying in the city of Corinth for a year and a half. In other words, Paul was the church planter in the city of Corinth. He pastored that congregation for a year and a half because God had said to him, Paul, remain, for I have many people in this city. And so Paul had remained. Now, we would expect having been started under the oversight of an apostle, it would have been certainly a perfect model church. But what we read when we begin to read the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, is that that church was anything but model, as it were. It was a church that was riff with strife and problems. As we read through the book, we read that there was major division within the church. Some were saying they were of Paul, and some were saying they were of Apollos, and some were saying they were of Peter, and some who were more spiritual were claiming even to be of Jesus. And there were cliques and divisions amongst the brethren. There was fighting. There was warfare. 
Paul says there was sexual immorality in the congregation of a type that even was not found among the pagans. Brothers were taking brothers to court and suing them. They couldn't resolve their problems in the courts of the church, and so they carried them into the public court, profaning the name of Christ. He tells us that there was discontentment in the congregation. They weren't satisfied with what God was doing in their midst. There was idolatry. They were eating and offering meat unto idols. They were profaning the Lord's table, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, to such a degree that even some of them had fallen asleep. They had died as a result of the judgment of God because of their lack of discernment concerning the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this was certainly a charismatic church. All of the early gifts of the Spirit in the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, were operative. But they were warring among themselves that one gift was greater than the other, or one was more spiritual if he spoke in tongues, or if he prophesied, or if he had a word of knowledge. And the Apostle Paul is writing and addressing himself to these particular concerns and situations and problems within the church. And it's in this place, it's in this context, that this particular chapter comes. In fact, when Paul is dealing with the question of spiritual gifts in chapter 12 and then later in chapter 14, he drops this chapter, chapter 13, right into the middle of that, and he does it by introducing it in chapter 12 in these words. Brethren, I will show you a still more excellent way. And then he starts at, if I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I am nothing. We also need to ask ourselves the question, what is love that Paul is speaking about here? Paul is not talking about some kind of emotional feeling, not talking about some kind of esoteric notion here, but he's talking about a love which is the act of the will. I believe the Bible defines for us love as being that disposition whereby one determines to behave toward another in a biblically prescribed way. Love is a disposition whereby one determines to behave toward another in a biblically prescribed way. Husbands, love your wives. Don't speak harshly to them. Don't treat them with unkindness. Don't exasperate your children. Wives, honor your husbands. Children, obey your parents. Yes, even we're commanded to love our enemies. Well, what in the world does that mean? Does it mean that I'm to have some kind of emotional <coughs> response or feeling towards my enemy? No. The Bible says to us that what it means is if my enemy is hungry, I'm to feed him. If he is thirsty, I'm to give him something to drink. If he is naked, I'm to give him some clothes. If he's cold, I'm to give him a blanket. And it is this love that the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it is this love that is the greatest of the heavenly triad. Now, faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, why would Paul say to us that this love that he is telling us about that is the more excellent way is the greatest of the heavenly triad. After all, we have faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, a faith that has been begotten in us by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. For we have not been saved by works, but by faith, not that of ourselves, but at faith which is a gift of God. That in that regenerating work of God's Spirit, the Spirit 
gave to me faith that I might lay a hold of Christ to my very salvation. Or that hope, as Peter says to us, we've been begotten again unto. Remember, he says, we've been begotten again unto a living hope by the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We have this blessed hope that on that day, this mortal shall put on immortality, this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and that I will stand in the presence of God and see him and be like him, for I shall see him as he is where every tear will be wiped away, where sin will be no more. But Paul says, faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these are love. Well, I think we can see why Paul would tell us that love is the greatest of the heavenly triad in these words. Love never ends. You see, faith will become sight. I walk by faith here in this life, but in that life I won't walk by faith. I'll walk by sight. I'll see with my eyes that my Redeemer lives and that I have been made like unto him and hope will be fulfilled. You see, we hope not for that which we have obtained. We hope for that which we long for, that which God has promised when we receive the fullness of his blessing. Hope will be fulfilled. Faith will become sight. But love never ends. It is the gift of God. The world does not have this love. It is a spirit-given love. For the fruit of the Spirit, Paul says in Galatians, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc. You see, this is a love that God says that no man has a greater love than this love, that love by which one would lay down his life for another. The Apostle Paul tells us and reminds us That this love is not simply a quantitative difference between what we have as Christians and what the world has. In other words, as Christians, we don't just happen to love a little bit more than the rest of the world. So that all that our message is, is to simply say to them, what you need is more love, more love to God, more love to your neighbor. No, it is that your love must be transformed. It must be new. It must be as a new creation because God has taken you and changed you. And he has removed the heart of stone, which only can love as the world loves, and replaced it with a heart of flesh that can love God with all of its might and with all of its strength and its neighbor as itself. But there are other reasons why the Apostle Paul, I think, tells us that love is the greatest of the heavenly triad. And the second is, is because love is the central distinguishing characteristic of the Christian man or woman. Love is the distinguishing characteristic of the Christian man or woman. Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this shall they know that you are my disciples by the love you have one for another. By this, they won't know by your willingness to do certain things or because of your abilities or because of your gifts But he says, they will know you're my disciples by the love you have one for another. Jesus says, if any man says he loves God, but he doesn't love his neighbor, he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. How can you say that you love a God whom you cannot see if you don't love the guy sitting right next to you? The neighbor next door, the co-worker beside you. The scripture says this is the distinguishing characteristic, the central distinguishing characteristic. 
Are we not told that many will come to Jesus in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do many miracles? Did we not cast devils? And he says, depart from me, ye worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. The distinguishing characteristic, the central characteristic, it's how the world knows that Christ is. And delivers what he promises in the gospel. You see, the glory of the gospel is not simply that God promises to rid us of the penalty of sin. And that is glorious, our justification being made right with God. But it's not just God saying my sin is forgiven. It's God delivering me from the power and the pollution and the pleasure and the very presence of sin when we will stand before him. He delivers me from that which destroys me and causes my greatest grief in its totality, in its fullness. All of the ramifications of sin are eradicated by the gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ. We will be full and complete, and we will be like him, for we will see him as he is on that great and glorious day. But we also know that love is the greatest of the heavenly triad because Christ constantly commands us to love. John 15, verses 12 and 17, Jesus says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another. You see, why is it that the Apostle Paul looks and says that this is the greatest of the heavenly triad? Because Christ says it is the greatest of the heavenly triad. It is the greatest commandment. Remember, our confession of faith and catechism summarizes the moral law. It asks us the question, where is the moral law summarily comprehended? It is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments, those ten words. The moral law of God is exceedingly broad, but God brings it to us in those Ten simple words, as Pastor Hughes said to us this morning, so that we have access unto those commandments that God has given to us, and those commandments are not grievous. But Jesus also summarizes the Ten Commandments for us, doesn't he, in the Gospel? Remember that one Pharisee that came up to him and said, Jesus What is the greatest commandment? Looking at all those ten, Lord, which one would you say to us is the greatest? Which one should we set above all others? And what does Jesus answer him? He says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, thy soul, thy mind, thy strength, and thy neighbor as thyself. In these are all the law, and the prophets. Everything that you will ever read concerning the commandments of God and the duties which God requires of us is summarily comprehended in those two great commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. And in keeping of those, you keep the whole law. You see, to break the law of love is to break all of the commandments. If the commandment to love our neighbor as we love ourselves is the the summary of the last six commandments, to break the law of the love is to break them all. But to keep them is to keep all of the law of God. Paul says love is the greatest of the heavenly triad. Why? Because love is more excellent than all the supernatural spiritual gifts that the church then possessed. He puts it in these terms. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I 
deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. You see, Paul would say to us, it's not what a man is able to do, but it is the way a man loves that makes him close to God. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Is it the guy that speaks tongue and does miracles and casts out demons? Paul says, no, it's the guy who loves God and his neighbor as himself. Love is greater than all of the spiritual gifts. Being a preacher doesn't make me closer to God than anyone else sitting in a pew. Being a theologian doesn't make me closer to God than anyone else sitting in the pew. Having gifts or having riches or having these kinds of things doesn't make me close to God. It's loving God with all my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength that makes us close to the Lord. Think about it in these terms. <clears throat> First Kings chapter 3, we're told the story of Solomon. One of those kind of stories that when we hear them, we would, we, we, dare I say, venture to think, what would I ask for if God actually came to me and said, ask what you will, and I'll hear it and grant it. Now, in the particular historical situation that Solomon lived in as a king of Israel, as a type of the Christ who was to come, Solomon, by God's grace, asked for wisdom from on high. And the Lord said, you could have asked for anything, and you asked for wisdom, so I'll give you wisdom, but I'll give you all of the other things along with it. All the things you could have asked for that you didn't ask for because you asked for the right thing. You asked for wisdom. But let's put it back in another context, reflecting on 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, which is the story of Jonathan and David. Jonathan, the son of the king of Israel, Saul, and David, the son of a shepherd, a poor shepherd boy, you would think as you read that story that in a relationship like that, that there would be this poor shepherd boy who would basically do anything and everything for that one who was the son of the king because of the advantage that comes by having such a relationship. Boy, if you got your best friend and he's the son of the king, you got it made. You have a lot of great opportunities. But the text doesn't tell us that David loved Jonathan. The text tells us that Jonathan loved David. And here's the son of the king giving to this poor shepherd boy everything that he has because he loves Can you imagine what it would be like if the church loved with just such a love? We go to prayer meetings and we hear people praying for revivals and prosperity and healings and this and that and the other thing. How often do we hear God's people praying and beseeching the Lord? Lord, teach us to love. Help me to love. Help me to love you with all of my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength. Help me to love my neighbor as I love myself. Can you imagine what the world would see if they saw a church in love in such a way? Jesus says, by this shall they know that you're my disciples, by the love you have one for another. We live in the midst of a world falling apart. We live in the midst of a world that is characterized by hate and rancor and war and jealousy and murmuring and backbiting. We live in the midst of a world that is falling apart and too often the church reflects the character of the world and not the character of Christ. We look like the Corinthian church and not like the people of God that Jesus said, by this shall they know that you are my disciples, by the love you have one for another. 
That's what we ought to be. And Paul is saying to us, this, brethren, is the more excellent way. Because love is the greatest of the heavenly triad. But he also says it is the greatest because all other works are hollow without love. First Corinthians 13, 3. They just become clanging cymbals and noisy gongs. Without love, he says, there's no profit. There's no benefit to all of the works that I do and participate in. Probably seen on the news, and I was reminded of this some weeks ago, about Philadelphia, the Pope being there. One of the things that happened yesterday as the Pope was giving one of his uh, speeches or sermons or whatever you want to call it there in Philadelphia, when he got all done, they rang the Liberty Bell, Leviticus 25.10, let liberty go forth. Some years ago, I was in Philadelphia going to seminary and decided to go down to take some friends into Center City, Philadelphia to go to Independence Mall and to see it as it was just shortly after our 200th year anniversary. And I wanted to see the Liberty Bell. I grew up in the western part of our country, heard all kinds of things about Philadelphia and the Liberty Bell, and I wanted to go see it. Well, as I came up to the bell, as I was looking at it there in its display house, I realized that this bell was thick, really, really thick. Not the way I'd ever imagined a bell of that size. And I was kind of looking at it and pondering it, and one of the uh, park guides, one of the tourist guys, came up and says, can I answer a question? I said, yeah, look how thick that bell is. It's huge. And he said, yes. I said, well, why is that? He said, you could have a big bell, but if it was very thin, when you rang it, it would go ding, ding, ding. And you'd probably hear it for about a block or two. You wouldn't hear it any further than that. And I heard it yesterday. I'd never heard it before. I heard it yesterday. When you rang that Liberty Bell, it goes, bong. And you could hear it. You could hear it reverberating over the radio. You could hear how that sound would carry. And you can imagine in your mind to say, listen, when that bell rang, people for miles and miles and miles and miles heard that bell. It wasn't the tinking of a clanging cymbal. It was the bong of a bell made to be heard. And Jesus says, without love, your works are like a bell that tinkles. But with love, it's like a bell that bongs and the world hears it. Jesus says to us that our works without love are dead. They're vain. They're fruitless. Even faith without love is fruitless. As Paul reminds us in Galatians 5.16, faith worketh by love. Hope is motivated by love. Without love, all becomes vain, powerless, empty, of no avail. So Paul says, faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So that brings us to that fundamental question. Do I have such a love? Do I have such a love? And how would I know if I did? What do I look for? Do I look for some feeling inside? Some kind of something there? Some emotion? Some, some welling up within me? No, the Bible says that love evidences itself in three ways. True biblical love. It does so, first of all, in its obedience. Second of all, in its submission and third of all, in its sacrifice. 
It's obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. My commandments are not grievous. David was able to say, oh, how I love your law, O Lord, and on it do I meditate day and night. I've hidden your law in my heart that I might not sin against thee. My mother was a great woman, and I suppose all little boys love their mothers. And I used to like to tell my mother that I loved her. I can remember standing in the kitchen, in the living room, in my bedroom, many different places, saying to my mom, Mommy, I love you. But one day I remember saying to my mother, Mommy, I love you, and she said, I don't think you do. And I was devastated. Why? Why would my mom say to me she didn't think I love her? I tell her all the time, Mommy, I love you. I said, why would you, why would you say you don't think I love you? She said, because you don't obey me. You don't do what I ask you to do. If I ask you to take out the trash, you don't. If I ask you not to pick on your sisters, you don't pay attention. And the older you get, the worse it becomes. I don't know if I believe you anymore that you really love me. I was devastated. We say to God, we love you, but we don't keep his commandments. You young people tell your parents that you love them, but you don't obey them. You don't listen to what they have to say. You fathers say to your children that you love them but you exasperate them and you mistreat them and you provoke them to all manner of unrighteousness, the Bible says. You husbands tell your wives you love them, but you neglect them. You don't give yourselves to them as you ought. You women say to your husbands, we honor you, but then we speak reproachfully and wickedly of them. True biblical love is obedient love. It gives to the Lord. And it gives to one another. It's submissive love. It submits to all circumstances. Worldly love is characterized by complaining and backbiting and bitterness. But biblical love is characterized by a submissive attitude, remembering that God does all things and he does all things well, that he loves us. And he who loves us will never let any harm come to us. Nothing happens but only to his glory and our good. And we submit even as the angels do in heaven. Christ taught us to pray that way because we are to love that way. Love and submission to him. What you do, Lord, you do well. And we don't have to murmur, complain. We can say amen to every circumstance and situation in our life. Yes, Lord, and so let it be because this is right and good and holy. And it's sacrificial. Notice how the apostle reminds us when he says it does not insist on its own way might be trite to use this illustration when John Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. That's love, biblical love. Ask not what God can do for you. Ask not what your neighbor can do for you. Ask what you can do for God, what you can do for your neighbor, how you can lay yourself out, how you can give yourself to that one to love them with all of your strength and might and heart and soul. We talk about evangelism. We talk about going out and being trophies of God's grace. Where are they going to see that work in us? They're going to see it as they see that love of Christ which constrains us, that works within us. That love that grows out of the reality of, and the truth that he has first loved us. And so therefore we love him and we give ourselves to him and we look to him and to him alone for all things. You see, the world is not ignorant. They're not blind. 
If we call men and women everywhere to love Christ and we don't love him ourselves, they will not take us seriously. If we tell people that Christ has delivered us from all the hatred and the rancor and the sin of this world, but they see us still full of hate and rancor and sin, they will not take us seriously. And that's what Paul's saying to the Christians there at Corinth. He said, listen, you guys, you're acting like a bunch of children. You're acting like two-year-olds. When I was a child, I fought as a child. And I behaved as a child. But when I became a man, I did what? I put away childish things. I stopped behaving like an adolescent. And that would be God's message to us as the church of Jesus Christ today. Stop acting like adolescents. We live in the midst of a world falling apart. And we have the answer that the world needs. And that is Jesus. Because there is no other name given under heaven whereby men might be saved. He sets his people free from their sins in the totality of its guilt and its pollution and its power and all of its ramifications. Jesus says, if I make them free, they shall be free indeed. And that freedom is exemplified and showed forth in how we love God and how we love one another. So what must we do? We must examine ourselves. And we don't have to be afraid of examination. God already knows what's in our hearts. He already knows all the places we fail and fall short. He knows all the lack of love that I have toward my wife and my children and my neighbor, toward him. But he still says, search your heart and try their, your way. And if there be any wicked way within you, confess that before me. And I don't have to be afraid to confess it before him because he said, if you confess your sin, I am faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See, God doesn't want us to search ourselves so that we get discouraged and run away. He wants us to search ourselves so that we see and confess and are drawn closer, sanctified by his spirit, becoming more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't love as I ought to love. And so what do I do? Do I run and hide? No. I confess my sin. I ask Jesus by his grace to make me love him with all of my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength. Search my heart to see if my love is in a flourishing state. Search my heart to ask, how can I love my wife more? How can I love my children more? How can I love my neighbor more? How can I love Jesus more? Why would I not want to love my wife more? She is the love of my life. She is my wife. Why wouldn't I want to love her more? Why wouldn't I want to love my children more? They are bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Why would I not want to love my neighbor more? For those for whom Christ has died to save and to bring to glory. It's the love of Christ that constrains us. Why wouldn't I want to love Jesus more? Give more of my heart and my soul and my mind and my strength to him. So I must search my heart and try my way. I must be conscious about putting away childish things. Laying them aside. We are to mature as Christians. We are to grow in grace. We are to be sanctified by his spirit. celebrated a birthday yesterday and as I was able to add another year in the number of years that I've had in my life I kind of looked in the mirror and asked the question how many less hairs do I have or how many more gray ones do I have do I really look like I'm as old as I am 
Do I look younger than I ought? All those kinds of questions about the physical man, which you naturally do as you grow older in years, especially for some of us that are reaching that latter portion of our lives. Listen, I, I'm perfectly cognizant of the reality that I'm probably in at least the last third of my life, if not the last quarter of my life. God will take me home soon. And my body reminds me of that constantly. But I had to ask myself the question, as I have grown older in my body, have I grown older in my spiritual man? Have I matured? Have I put away those childish things, those sins that so easily beset me? that caused me to stumble and to fall and not be the testimony that God has called me to be, saved me to be, redeemed me out of my sin to be as a trophy of his grace. Putting away those childish things. Search our hearts. Put away childish things. Thirdly, learn to meditate long and hard and deep on Christ's deeds of love. No greater love hath any man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. Been meditating and thinking about Isaac. Both my son Isaac, but the biblical character Isaac in the book of Genesis. That portion in Genesis that talks about God coming to Abraham, and we often read that, how God comes to Abraham and says to him, Abraham, offer up the son of promise as a sacrifice to me. And Abraham had to go for three days. I think the Bible would teach us that literally Isaac was dead in the mind of Abraham for three days. Abraham had determined that he would be obedient to God. He was going to take his son Isaac to the place where God would show him. He would build an altar. He would offer his son as God had commanded him. Now, we look at that and we say, well, can you imagine the internal struggle? You know, the New Testament talks about us, talks about Abraham as, as not staggering at the promises of God. Well, that's the kind of thing that would make you stagger, wouldn't it? Make you step back and say, whoa, wait, wait. But Abraham, the scripture says to us, believed God. He believed God, and that's a good thing. But I started thinking about Isaac. Can you imagine? Now, here's Isaac. The Bible tells us that at one point in the journey, Isaac actually turns to his father and says, Hey, Dad, I have a question to ask you. I see the wood. I see the fire. I see the knife. I see everything, but I don't see the sacrifice. The light was dawning. Abraham simply said, God will provide. Isaac went on, went up the hill, they built the altar, laid out the wood. The scripture says that Isaac was then bound by Abraham. There's no record of any struggle. There's no record of any trying to get away. There's just the record that Isaac trusted and loved his father and was obedient even unto death, if necessary. Thinking long and hard and deep on the love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There was no delusion in the mind of Christ. Christ was not deceived in any way. He knew as he stood in the garden, as he walked in that ministry in Palestine that he would lay down his life as a ransom for many. He who was in the form of God, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, who made himself of no reputation, taking upon him the likeness and the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the shameful, painful death of the cross because he loved because he would lay down his life as a sacrifice and a ransom for many, because he loved 
and his divinity didn't shield him from the agonies and the tortures in his body and soul of God's full fury and wrath that was poured out upon him because of the sins, not just simply of men, but because of my sins, because of my iniquities, because of my Breaches of God's most holy law. Christ suffered and died because he loved, he loved me. He loved you. He had his name on, your name on his lips as he hung on Calvary's cross. He didn't die for some amorphous, some unknown elect. He died for each and every one that the Father had given to him. And he knew them by name. And he bore the full penalty and wrath of God for our sin. For the joy that was set before him. For the love that he had toward us. You're going to come to the table next week. Pastor Hugh said you should think about what you'll be doing. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And that's what we're remembering. That Christ died because he loved he gave his life as a ransom for many because he loved, because he loved us, because he loved me. Paul says to us, now abideth these three, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Let us pray. Our gracious God and Father, Oh, how we do love you, O oh Lord, because you have first loved us. But we beseech you this morning that by your grace you would teach us to love you even more. To love you with all of our hearts, our soul, our mind, our strength. Father, help us as we venture to peer into your love for us, that we would have an understanding that it might motivate us not only in our love for you, but in our love one for another, our love for our wives, our love for our children, our love for our parents, our love for our neighbors. Yes, Lord, even our love for our enemies. Father, we are overwhelmed by your love. We are overwhelmed by your mercy and grace. Be pleased, O oh Lord, to teach us that we might Show the world the greatness of your glory and grace. And we ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn or psalm of response this morning is Book of Psalms for Singing, Selection 23B.